So what we're going to talk about today is how does uh, a technical product progression take place. The base technologies we're going to be talking about software, mechanical, electrical, and chemical. And how do we involve a business out of that? In terms of technical progression, the first thing you do is feasibility, that maybe you can't even do this. And so you take the hot button issues and you basically go out and get data and show, hey, it is feasible to do this. Once it's feasible, those little parts are feasible to do, then I go do a prototype, then I make my alpha. My alpha shows off my functionality, but it may not have the fitter form, color, everything else to be product ready. My beta is pretty much my uh, product that I want to go to market with, but it's buggy and so I need to go out there and get it smoothed over. And my gamma is, means is that it's production ready. Now in terms of a prototype, the thing about a prototype is uh, these are the most common problems that show up. One is that people tend to be wasteful. And that's that people don't look at what already exists. They just build off what they want to do. And so there's a lot of repetition. Uh, you have to think about what the value of your product are. And what is it that you need to highlight? Because when you make your prototype, you get one shot at it. And then another thing you have to be careful about, and this is why I don't necessarily agree that the first thing you need to do at, go out is in marketing. And that's that you start making promises to people. You start telling them all this stuff. And when you don't deliver, that kills your company. The biggest reason why startups fail is you overpromise and you underdeliver. Show me a startup that failed, I can show you that's exactly what they did. So in terms of feature of the prototypes, which approach is superior? Meaning, is it better to go out and find what people want? and then go ahead and build that. And that's typically how you get line extensions. Or is it better off that you connect to a value? You've probably heard it's a product that the market didn't know what it wanted, but it, it, it's what it wanted. Well, yes and no. Meaning, uh, it, if there was no demand for it, then it, would do, it wouldn't connect to a value. And so, yeah, you're building something totally new, but it's still connecting to a value that you know the customers have always had. The big danger, though, of going with that approach is you hit some arrogance where you're thinking, oh, if I build it, they'll come, and that doesn't work either. And so this is why, and for those of you who took 310 with me probably remember this, is first you want to find your minimum lovable product. What is the passion that people are going to have about your product versus something that's just going to be validated? Uh, the big goal of your prototype is quite simply, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to demonstrate enough value so you can move on to the next step. After fundraising, you can go out and hire the experts to clean it up and make it pretty. So examples of uh, prototypes are my microgyroscope. Uh, to get a feel for how small that gyroscope is, that center section is shown in the right picture. And that right picture, to get a feel for how small that is, that's Abraham Lincoln's nose from a penny. <laughs> that's the size it was. The prototype we came out with was the size of a toaster. Now, the marketing people just about barfed and said, how are we supposed to sell a micro gyroscope when it's not micro? But the point is, is that it was functional. It did what a gyroscope is supposed to do. And so what you do in these situations, and that's the core. That's what people wanted. People wanted to see, can I actually build a device like this that actually worked? Because nobody had ever done it before. And so we actually gave it to GM. And what did GM do? They put it in a car and they drove around with it worked beautifully. They tried to do U-turns, they tried to do fast turns, they tried to slow down. They put it through all the paces and the gyro came out as a champ. And then they started to complain about the size. And what did we do? We popped the thing open and showed, look, here's the sensor and how small it was. The reason why this thing is so big is the electronics. And here's our plan to shrink that down. By the time we get to the end, this will be in a very small package. They bought it because a lot of people in the world were actually doing that, turning boards into chips. Instagram. Kevin Sistron's first Instagram, he put every bell and whistle on it and the thing didn't work. But the one thing that did work in it 
was the photo feature. And that's what people love to begin with. So Sistron actually lucked out there. Dyson. Dyson actually made 4,000 prototypes and kept showing it to people. Uh, his first sale was in Japan. And that kind of makes sense because the Japanese have his particular taste about their style and fashion. And his company was pretty much funded by his wife and he went into debt. The thing is, if you're too far away from a prototype, you have to recognize that. If there are too many questions about it, then guess what? You need to work more on feasibility and get closer to the answer. And here's an example that somebody said, oh, look, we made this cochlea implant to mimic human hearing. Well, the thing is, for that whole thing to be feasible as a device, it's got to look something like this. How do I get from there? I mean, even the batteries alone are monstrous. To get to something that's actually portable and doesn't interfere with people. And so you have to think about what's my story. And if the story is too long or there's too many things that have to happen, guess what? Those things that have to happen are your feasibility and you need to go back. A lot of lean development kind of falls apart when you do physical products. And the reason why is it costs money to pivot. Every time you do a new iteration, yeah, software, you're just pushing electrons around. No big deal. But if you're cutting metal and all, all of a sudden there, it is a big deal. All of a sudden there are uh, physical time that you have to deal with. Like if something has to bake for two days and has to bake for two days, there's no way you can accelerate it. The thing is, Reese is a software engineer, and so a lot of his book is biased towards software, but that doesn't necessarily pertain to physical products. Now, the general thinking, though, is and what Reese has always defended his book about, is that it's about this mentality of going there and testing. And all that is a good thing. But the thing you also have to be careful about is when you go for speed and this attitude of, oh, it's okay if it's buggy, you only get one chance to make an impression. And so there are two main variables we worry about. Am I selling to businesses or are I selling to individual customers? And do I have a software product or do I have a physical product? And as you can see, there are different kinds of demands based on the services and everything else. And the demands for physical products are much, much higher. Not only that, when you're selling to businesses, they have a very high standard because they're taking your product and putting it into their product set. And if your thing is bad, guess what? Their entire thing goes down the tubes. So the bar gets raised on you. If you have a lot of prototype failures, you have to prepare for the fact that you are not going to hit your uh, release dates. And so, again, you're over-promising to your customers. The thing, is, uh, the thing that also kills startups is when you hit a problem and you start to spin in circles you don't start moving against it. And so you get lost in the woods. And this is what I mean about looking at the larger perspective or understanding where you are in the context. And that's that you need to look at the forest as opposed to the trees. Now in terms of prototyping, here are your options. You can do it yourself. You can develop resources, meaning have people on your team who can actually do it. You could be well capitalized, have a lot of money, and then you can just spend money and have other people do it for you. You can bootstrap, and that's that. Uh, basically be creative in the ways people can help you. Now, when we went to the moon, Apollo 11 went to the moon and back, had a three megahertz processor and about 16 kilobits of RAM. Your cell phone typically has a one and a half megahertz processor and you've got uh, greater than a gigabit of RAM in your, in your phone alone. You have computing power anywhere from 500 to 1,000 times greater than what you got to the moon and back. So why isn't that you're doing more? What separates you from them? The thing is, at that time, we had great will. We wanted to get to the moon. We wanted to get back. And it's because of that will that we were able to get away with less technology, but be able to make it. And that's what it comes down for you. Do you have the will? A good example are firefighters. Fire hose rates, flow rates, basically comes is dependent on the nozzle that you have. As you can imagine, a smaller nozzle, you get more force. Uh -huh. 
but not as great spread. And then on a larger nozzle, it's different. So which one do you want? Well, the thing is, firemen have uh, an equation on paper that they look at. Yeah, having paper on a fire probably isn't the best thing in the world. And so Mike Rabin made an app where that information is on an app. So firefighters wouldn't have to worry about whether or not they brought this piece of paper with them. And another firefighter, Emmett Carolan, improved on it. The thing is, none of these guys were coders. They just took some online class, learned, taught themselves how to code and make it. Why? Because they have will. If you look around the world, this is a do-it-yourself world now. This is about the information's out there. This is also the age of content marketing. Guess what? They're going to give you all the information that you need. Uh, before there was an internet, I made an optical thin film stress gauge. I didn't know anything about optics. I was an electrical engineer. But I taught myself, and the way I taught myself is sales engineers. I just got on the phone, asked them a whole bunch of questions, and they gave me an education. Well, now you don't need to do that anymore. You have something called the internet. The other big push in all this is globalization. If you can't find a resource here, there's somewhere in the world where you can get it from. This is why Alibaba is uh, the biggest website in the world. The thing is, companies also want networks around their products, and so they want users coming together. They want you to share information. They want you to talk about their product. And so this is the age where all the resources are out there for you. It's just a matter of you going out and getting them. And so the components of do-it-yourself is you have an idea, so you need to get to a prototype. You need a place to work. You need a place to implement your idea. And finally, you need the tools to, to do it. And I'll talk about that in the next lecture.